Chapter 10 It took until the wheels thudded onto the tarmac at JFK that Steve started properly thinking about the week ahead. He'd had a hectic itinerary drawn up by Tina, repeatedly assured that working with the US was no different to the UK. Most things in the music business are done at night, wherever you are, but this time the jet lag would render him useless on the evening of the first full day. He needed to stay awake as late as possible to avoid suffering the consequences of being up before 5am tomorrow morning, giving him a fighting chance of making the evening. This meant he was in no rush to get into Manhattan, which was just as well as the long queue that snaked back from the immigration's desk was like nothing Steed experienced before. Even the toughest European queues were nothing more than 20 minutes of slow-moving human traffic, but as 20 turned to 30 and the half hour became more than an hour, his excitement turned to irritation. The queue didn't ever seem to move, and with the intimidating eyes of the security people and the multitude of cameras fixed on everyone, the hour and a half spent in the queue was one of the longest periods of Steve's short life. By the time this virgin entrant to America had reached the processing desk, few people from this flight were behind him. He had seen his cabin crew pass through about an hour before. This was a real anticlimax. Good afternoon, sir. What is the purpose of your visit to America? I'm representing a band and we're setting up a tour over here. Steve was unprepared for the questioning and unsure what to do with the declaration form he'd been nursing for the last hour. The heavily built official looked up. The answer had set off something in the officer which made him uneasy. Little did Steve know he was about to get played with. He was clearly no threat to national security, but as Steve started to panic at having said something that had suddenly made him a person of interest, he noted what he thought was the slightest sign of a smile. A band, you say? Aren't there American people already in the United States of America who do that sort of thing? Why is it necessary for you to come here and do a job an American would do, Sonny? Are you trying to put us out of work? Steve stammered a few words, but nothing coherent came out. He hadn't been warned that the trickiest part of the business trip to the U.S. would be his entry into the place. I'm the band's representative. We, we can't appoint an American to represent the band until the American agents know there is a band to represent. And if I don't represent them, how will the Cormacs get the exposure in the U.S. to go on one of the biggest bands in the world? Steve hastily rolled into a soliloquy to the amusement of the border guard. From the broad smile on his face, the official knew he'd won this one. He always won. Mr. Lewis, I'm messing with you, sir. Welcome to America and good luck. You'll need it. The guard chuckled once more before stamping the passport while offering a knowing wink. Steve was finally allowed in for a whole month. Wanker! Collecting his luggage, which was still doing the lonely circular tour of the carousel, Steve strode through the sliding doors which signified the barrier between no man's land and American soil. It should have felt more symbolic, but as with much of the day, it was yet another anticlimax. At least the queue for one of the yellow New York taxis moved quickly. The drivers were controlled through a series of whistles and hand signals, reminding him of the sheepdog trials which the BBC passed off as family entertainment back in the 80s. This was the sort of bustle he was expecting, and he excitedly jumped into the next vehicle, telling the driver to head for the Hilton on 6th Avenue. This was the standard hotel all his colleagues used, booked for him by the agency, mainly because of the benefits of patronising one chain which rewarded people like him with ever so minimal travel privileges. Yeah? Hilton. Sixth Avenue, please, Steve repeated. Manhattan? New York? Que? What was this shit? Is Manhattan somewhere different to New York? And what's with all the Spanish? Steve started to panic, ignorant of the local geography and suddenly very concerned this was one of Tina's tricks. Perhaps there was no Sixth Avenue or Hilton Hotel. Steve passed a piece of paper with the hotel details through the plastic divide. Finally, some positive acknowledgement from the Hispanic driver, who passed the paper back before repeatedly nodding his acknowledgement at the destination. The driver was no longer fearful that he would lose the fare. As the car started its crawl towards the city, Steve slouched back into the grubby back seat, finally relaxing just enough to take in his first view of the America he intended to conquer. Ahead of him, Steve recognised the towering sights of what he now knew was Manhattan, fixating on the numerous world-famous landmarks outside the car window. After emerging from the depths of the Queen's Tunnel, he felt an immediate change in atmosphere. Now, on Manhattan Island, the slow-moving procession of traffic was even more stop-start than the road in from JFK. A constant battle through the jaywalking pedestrians and flashing lights all set to a soundtrack of irritated car horns. It was as if he were a competitor in a loud, lifelike game of Frogger. The driver snaked along the 37th Street, all the way to 6th and 53rd, where a brick canopy hung over the hotel's drop-off zone. 
Steve had arrived later than he'd expected to, but there was still daylight, and in a city new to him there was lots to do. Before he paid for the ride, he was pounced on by the hotel staff, which offered to carry his bags. Wherever he was visiting, he hated this part of travel. Just because he wasn't on his own patch, he didn't suddenly lose the ability to open his own door, carry his own bags, press the button on the lift, or find the way to his room. Thanking the bellboy for his time, Steve moved through the revolving glass door into the well-lit foyer and to the check-in desks manned by the United Nations of eager receptionists, keen to meet his gaze. Good evening, sir. Welcome to the New York Hilton Midtown. How can I help you? As Steve turned and looked around to confirm he was the intended recipient of this mouthful of a salutation, he noticed a pretty young woman sitting on one of the heavy foyer chairs. She was clearly watching him and, on catching his eye, waved the tiniest of acknowledgments in his direction. Urgently racking his memory for who it could be, Steve couldn't place her. He met hundreds of people, often after a few drinks. He had no idea who it was or why she was paying him attention. After checking in, he noticed that the lady, whoever she was, was still looking at him. It would bug him all evening unless he found out why the stranger was waving to him. He would have to find out. Hi there. I'm so sorry. I haven't got my best head on and I'm a touch disoriented. Do we know each other? Well, not exactly. It's, it's just that I served you on the flight earlier on. The lady, not much older than a girl, had started to blush. Wow, this is embarrassing. I wasn't sure if you recognised me and it's clear that you don't. It was now Steve who was feeling the embarrassment. In his profession, it was important to never forget a face, but to be fair to him, their engagement had been hardly significant, and he'd been in and out of sleep for most of the journey. So, this is awkward, Isla joked. Should we just forget it happened? Not a chance. She's gorgeous. Sorry about being off the pace. I'm usually much more reliable. Have you been to New York much? I'm guessing cab and crew stick to the same route, so you must come here all the time. No, I've just moved off the European routes, and this is the first time here, so... The woman lowered her voice, looking all around her. I snuck away from the rest of the crew as I wanted to explore things for myself, if you know what I mean. I love the sneaking off thing. I travel a lot too and can't tell you the number of times I wanted to do the same. Seeing something for the first time without having a running commentary makes it a more personal experience. It's my first time here too. I've just lost my US virginity. So we're two virgins together then. Excellent. Flirty and beautiful. Both blushed a little as they looked down, then away before instinctively catching each other's eye in their own. I expect your off-duty time is limited. What are you doing hanging around a hotel lobby talking to the likes of me when this city is waiting out there for you? Well, it was you who approached me, Isla quickly replied. They both laughed, already having hit their strides. One of the reception staff is bringing me a discount card for an Italian place in Greenwich Village. He mentioned his cousin. Every hotel receptionist has a cousin who can help with something. Well, I'm pleased to have interrupted your wait. My name's Stephen, but everyone calls me Stee. Isla, pleased to meet you again. Does the first time count? Who cares? We've met now. Aren't you tired? I slept on the plane, but you've been working since God knows when. I'm young, free and single and in one of the world's greatest cities. I'm going to explore until I drop and that may or may not be in this building. Ask her out. Ask her out. Stee took the plunge. There was nothing to lose. You, uh, want some company? I don't mean to impose, but I'm about to do the same just without the discount card. Isla's face lit up. Nice smell man had displayed an interest. There was no awkwardness in this conversation. This could be fun. Yes, I do. I'd like that. Great. Hold tight and let me dump my bags. Count to a hundred and I'll be back down. Suddenly excited at the prospect of the evening ahead, Steve raced away, having made a beautiful new friend with whom to explore this fantastic city. Bring it on.